So I'm very excited to be here and have the chance to present this paper, which I wrote with my former PhD classmate, Karthik Sastry, Inappropriate Technology, Evidence from Global Agriculture. So the starting point is that global research and development innovation is highly concentrated in a handful of countries. To give you one example, by one estimate, 25% of total uh, research and investment happens in just the US, as compared to 3.6% in all of Africa and South Asia combined. However, it, uh, in, in growth economics, there are two highly contrasting interpretations of the impact of these vast disparities in research investment on disparities in productivity. One perspective suggests that in general, ideas are broadly applicable and can spread around the world from innovating countries. So even if innovation only happens in a handful of predominantly rich countries, technological progress in those rich countries reduce global disparities in the long run as technologies diffuse. A second contrasting interpretation, however, is that technology is in general highly context specific, designed to match the specific characteristics and conditions of the places that develop it, and as a result is often inappropriate in places dissimilar from those frontier innovative countries. In this perspective, technological progress in the frontier and the specific focus of innovation can actually generate and underlie persistent disparities in productivity around the world. Now, the second inappropriate technology hypothesis has been in the literature for many decades, dating back to the 60s and 70s, our understanding of its global incidence and quantitative importance is relatively poorly understood. So what this paper does is it attempts to investigate each pillar of this inappropriate technology hypothesis empirically in the context of global agriculture, a sector where all of its underlying forces loom potentially particularly large. And to give you an example of exactly what we mean, uh, I'm going to start with this story about basically three pests. So these three pests are, you know, might look similar. They're three dominant threats to corn production around the world. But there are important things that separate them. The first two, the European maize borer and the maize rootworm, are dominant threats in the US and Europe and in the US respectively. As a result, they've been the subject of massive amounts of scientific research, R&D investment, so much so that the maize rootworm is now referred to as the billion dollar bug. And one accomplishment of this research is the development of a genetically modified variety that is designed to specifically target these two varieties and make corn able to withstand these threats in the US and Europe. Okay. The third pest, however, is the maize stock borer. It's a dominant threat to corn production in large parts of sub-Saharan Africa. By one estimate, decimates 10% of corn production in Kenya each year. However, perhaps as a result of where it is and the types of farmers it affects, it's not been the subject of much R&D investment, and the new technologies developed to combat these first two, it turns out don't work as well against the third, and it remains a dominant threat to production in large parts of the world. So this is the inappropriate technology story in a nutshell, but beyond a handful of case studies like this, we don't really know the extent to which this type of narrative explains the global diffusion of technology, and moreover, we don't know the extent to which stories like this can explain productivity differences around the world in agriculture. So that's what this paper really tries to do. So the first thing we do I'm going to give you the outline of the whole paper on this one slide. As our, our, the main thing we need to measure is inappropriateness. So how do we measure the extent to which technology developed in one environment is appropriate in another? And to do that, building exactly on that example I just told you, we combine, we measure at the crop by country pair level dissimilarity in their local pest and pathogen environment using comprehensive data we've collected on the global distribution of all known crop affecting pests and pathogens, bugs, viruses, fungi, protists, etc as well as which specific crops they can attack. Um, and we, and you know, we combine this with data first on variety development and diffusion to think about technology development and diffusion, and second, on agricultural production to think about productivity. Next, we're going to present two main results. That frontier technology's inappropriateness, as measured in this you know, dissimilar, dissimilarity of pest and pathogen environment, first inhibits international biotechnology transfer and adoption, so really affects which places around the world get modern technology, and second, lowers crop specific output by shifting production away from crops that are, uh, for which frontier technology is less appropriate. So reduces technology diffusion and lowers output. And you know, thinking about these reduced form estimates combined with a model, we argue that this mechanism, just focuses, focusing on differences driven by pest and pathogen dissimilarity, can explain about 10 to 15 percent of productivity gaps around the world, and moreover are important for understanding and interpreting ongoing changes in the geography of R&D and environmental change around the world. So for example, it affects how we think about the rise of new technology leaders and the importance of having R&D in different parts of the world and the impact, for example, of the rise of China, and also the impact of climate change, which is going to shift ecology and geography in different parts of the world, and as a result, which technology works well where. Okay. 
So the first thing I'm going to tell you about is the measurement, which the key goal here is exactly to measure this inappropriateness thing that, that, that the whole paper is about. So to do that, we combine data on crop pest and pathogen, which I'm going to refer to as CPP, just because it makes it less of a mouthful. So we combine CPP level information sheets from this CABI, Center for Agricultural Biosciences International Crop Pest Compendium. And they basically do a literature search of, you know, sources ranging from the World Bank to the Food and Agriculture Organization to the USDA to try to be as comprehensive as possible. And this has really become the gold standard for measurement in the biological sciences of where these crop pests and pathogens are. And we use two key pieces of information that I'm showing you in this map. The first is the, the global distribution of each one of these roughly 5,000 CPPs. So this is the African maize stock borer that was in the photos at the beginning, and it's showing you which countries it, it, um, it lives in. The second key piece of information is which crops each of these things can affect. So we also know uh, which of, of any of the 132 host plants each, each uh, pest and pathogen can attack. So for example, for the maize stock borer, that's maize, sorghum, rice, sugar cane, etc. And the key piece of information that we get from all this is the identity of all CPPs in a given country, or in some cases region within a country, uh, that damages a particular crop. Using that, we construct what is our main measure of inappropriateness or technology's inappropriateness at the crop by country pair level, which I'm going to refer to as CPP mismatch, at the crop by origin by destination level, which is one minus the number of CPPs those two environments share have in common, normalized by the number of CPPs in each location to the one half power. So you can think of that as like one minus the correlation between uh, the two, and it turns out it's part of a standard class of, of uh, divergence measures that that ecologists and population, uh, population biologists use. And you know, we can change this in a number of ways. It turns out the functional form doesn't really matter so much. And there are other kind of robustness tests we can do to this measure, thinking about purging any variation from invasive species, which we have other strategies to measure, and also measuring only the variation that emerges directly from like fixed ecological and geographic characteristics. But for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to just talk about this CPP mismatch measure as our main source of, of inappropriateness. So the first thing we want to verify is this sort of premise of the inappropriate technology hypothesis, which is that research is really focused on these problems that exist in rich countries, in this case super concrete, on the pests and pathogens that live in rich countries. So I'm just going to show you this kind of one way to look at this. The first thing to note is that researchers focus on their local problems. So like, um, this is just showing you that relative to CPPs that exist in other countries, innovators are 17 times more likely to take out a patent related to a crop pest and pathogens in the country in which they work. That fact, combined with the fact that most R&D happens in a handful of rich countries, leads to a major skew in the focus of research toward these pests and pathogens that live, for example, in the U.S. as compared to ones that live in not the U.S. And to give you one particularly striking cut of the data, over there I'm showing you the number of patents related to each crop pest and pathogen that exists only in Brazil, or only in India, or only in the U.S. And the differences are staggering. 1, 1.9, and then 42. So huge disparities in the focus of research. So the question is, how does this matter first for technology transfer, technology diffusion? Okay, so last piece of data I need to present uh, in this talk before getting to some actual results. We, need to, we want to measure technology diffusion around the world. To do that, we compile seed certificates, which are basically like patents for seeds, uh, for all countries with any protection for, for, for seed varieties. So that's the green countries in this map. This is, we got, get this data from the Union for the Protection of New Varieties, which is the international body tasked with harmonizing this information and standardizing it across countries. And the key thing we have in this database, which is actually in this organization's constitution to compile this information, is the unique identity of a variety that is first protected in one country and then subsequently in another. So we can track individual seed varieties where they're first developed and everywhere else they're subsequently protected. To do that, we can construct our main outcome variable for this uh, part of the analysis on technology diffusion, which is the number of varieties for a given crop first developed in a country L prime and subsequently transferred to country L in a fixed cross section since 2000. In the paper, we think more about dynamics, but for here now, I'm just going to show you static results. And so our first estimating equation is looking at exactly the relationship between inappropriateness, as measured by CPP mismatch, and technology transfer at the crop by origin by destination level, conditional on all two-way fixed effects. So country pair fixed effects capturing things like trade and geographic distance and cultural distance and things like that. Origin by destination fixed effects capturing like overall R&D at the origin, at the sending country. Uh, and destination by crop fixed effects capturing things like you know, market size, characteristics of producers, overall levels of education, technology use, et cetera. All of that we can absorb in these fixed effects. And our hypothesis, if this inappropriate technology hypothesis is true, is that this beta is going to be negative. Okay? That inappropriateness is a barrier to the diffusion of technology. 
And that's exactly what we find across specifications, either focusing on the combination of the intensive and extensive margins or looking at them both separately. And these results suggest that for the median crop by country pair in our sample, this mechanism reduces the amount of technology you get by about 30%. But now, so this is a, a sample of all countries and all crops. But the story that kind of I tried to motivate the talk with was really about this kind of concentration of R&D in a handful of countries and the fact that being dissimilar or being inappropriate relative to that, those handful of innovation intensive countries is particularly costly. So to investigate that hypothesis, I take the same regression, great. Restoration, include an interaction term between whether the origin country, the sending country, is what I'm going to call a frontier innovator for a given crop. And I'm just going to define that as one of the countries that develops the highest number of varieties for that crop in the world. So if you make the most corn seeds for a particular crop, your country innovates the most corn seeds, I'm going to call you a leader country for corn, same for wheat, etc. And now, if this beta 2 is negative, that means that it's particularly costly in terms of the amount of technology you get to be dissimilar ecologically to these leader countries. And again, that's exactly what we find. Either defining the leader as a top variety developer, top two or top three. In the top three case, it basically only reduces the amount of technology you get relative to that set of leader countries. The rest of the countries essentially don't matter from a statistical point of view. So countries, or co country by crop pairs, local producers, for which frontier technology is inappropriate, really don't get access to modern technology. But in the remaining minutes, I want to show that that doesn't just matter for access to technology. It actually affects production and productivity around the world. So to investigate that, we turn to the second estimating equation, where now the outcome variable is output for a given crop in a given country. And on the right-hand side, our measure of inappropriateness now is that CPP mismatch relative to the frontier countries, the one, two, or three countries I showed you before. The results, I'm going to just consider there being sort of two frontier countries, but you can do it with any number, up to three. Now conditional just on crop and country fixed effects and some controls that I'm not going to explain in detail. I'm happy to answer questions about. We really want to make sure that we're purging any variation driven by differences in innate suitability around the world that might be dri driving output differences. So we have a number of strategies to try to account for any differences in the fact that land differences around the world just make certain areas more or less productive for certain crops in an innate perspective absent technology. And so now beta being negative means that inappropriateness affects not just technology transfer but also output. And that's what we're showing in this table. So for the, this negative coefficient means that the inappropriateness of frontier technology reduces substantially the amount to, to which that crop is produced in, in the country. One way to think about the magnitudes is that a one standard deviation increase in your inappropriateness measure reduces output by about 0.5 standard deviations. We can do a number of robustness checks. I'm, again, happy to talk about these in question and answer. One thing that I think is maybe most interesting here is we can exploit natural experiments in which the geography of R&D changed around the world where pe people were doing research. The first is the Green Revolution of the 60s and 70s, and the second is the recent kind of massive rise of US biotechnology. And we can show that those changes in where research is getting done, and hence changes in the relevant notion of inappropriateness relative to the frontier, leads to changes in where production happens around the world, and as a result, the pattern of productivity and productivity disparities in different parts of the world. Okay. So in the remaining two minutes, I just want to talk to you a little bit about how we think about the aggregate consequences here. And basically, what we do in a nutshell is we combine sort of ex these exact reduced form estimates with a model that allows us to do two things. The first is adjust for the fact that those reduced form estimates combine the fact that um, uh, Inappropriateness is making each sort of unit of land more or less productive, but also affecting um, sort of where you might grow one crop or another. So it's affecting the underlying productivity distribution, only some of which is kind of comes out in that, in that regard. Or, so as a result, the reduced form coefficient combines both the direct productivity effects and the selection effects. We want to kind of take that seriously. And second, the fact that prices adjust. And so doing that, we can think about the aggregate consequences of inappropriateness. Here I'm showing you the loss in productivity due to inappropriateness in a histogram that's continent coded. And we estimate that this mechanism reduces global productivity by about 58%. And here I'm showing you the relationship between that country level loss in productivity and productivity today. It's strongly negatively correlated, suggesting that the countries that are losing most as a result of this mechanism are the ones that are also least productive in the modern cross-section. The result of which means that uh, inappropriateness explains 
about 14 to 15 percent of global disparities in productivity around the world. So a pretty large share of, of differences in productivity and productivity gaps. I think I have maybe one, one minute left. Or, okay. So the last thing we do is we think about, okay, that's kind of a, a, not such a real world counterfactual. What does it mean to remove inappropriateness? That's not something we can do with policy. But there are things you can do with policy. So one thing we can do with the model is to say, well, if we really think this mechanism is important, it tells us something about where we think research should be targeted to have the most benefit around the world. We can answer questions like that. We can also answer, you know, what the impact might be of climate change, which shifts where these different crop pests and pathogens can live around the world, and hence that network of inappropriateness across countries and what impact that might have. It turns out that might actually coordinate global research toward a more common set of threats, which could mitigate part of the negative direct effects of climate change. And finally, we can estimate the consequences of the rise of new technology leaders like BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, which it turns out actually span a larger share of global ecology and, you know, according to our results and model, will uh, sort of reduce this inappropriate technology problem by endogenously developing technology that is more appropriate for larger parts of the world. So, you know, in conclusion, uh, hopefully I've convinced you that this inappropriate technology mechanism is important, explains patterns of technology diffusion and productivity around the world. And I think we're interested in a range of future questions that I'll just leave up here about policy, about other sectors, about climate change. But, you know, rather than talk about that, I'll open it up to questions. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Thanks.